Thank you so much uh, for joining me on the podcast. I'm really excited to introduce uh, Professor Eric Kaufman. He is a professor of politics and an author of several books, uh, including White Shift, Populism, Immigration and the Future of White Majorities. He's also uh, a commentator and has been writing widely and, and been featured widely in the press, the newspapers and the magazines on many of the thorny moral and cultural debates uh, at the moment, whether that's the campus culture wars to uh, discussions about wokeness, uh, free speech, identity politics, and bigger, big picture discussions about the future of Western civilization. So thank you so much for joining me on the podcast. Well, thanks for having me. Uh, you know, I am. It's great to be here. What would be, I think, useful is um, to perhaps start off with some of the more prominent uh, research that you've done in the last few years, particularly discussing and exploring some of these issues about uh, political indoctrination um, and the and the kind of thorny debates about free speech and and who whose politics is dominant in our institutions. It, these are very big questions, but I think uh, many of our listeners are very interested in them. But what you, you've done research into these questions, so it'd be really useful to hear more about the research that you've done and why you wanted to explore that research and some of the things that you found. Yeah, well, th thanks, Inaya. That's true. And I, I should also say I have a book coming out which will explore the origins of woke and what to do about it. So that will be even more relevant to the question you just you just mentioned. Um, so I've done a number of, I did the book, of course, which is more about the rise of populism, Trump and Brexit and, and Le, Le Pen and so on. And that is partly related to the story you just mentioned insofar as uh, politically correct restrictions on debating, for example, levels of immigration. So you have political correctness really as an ingredient in shutting down a debate in the center by mainstream parties. And it's a bit like saying we're only going to sell uh, one pair of pants that's going to be black. It's like in the Soviet Union, right? We're going to sell one pair of pants. Well, the only people who are going to sell blue jeans are the black marketeers who are going to set up outside. Uh, and so the populists are, are black marketeers offering what the mainstream parties cannot offer because of restrictions on what they're allowed to debate. Um, and you saw that in a number of countries, Sweden most obviously, and Germany as well during the migrant crisis. Now, I then did a, a number of think tech reports looking at the culture wars, um, and when I say culture wars, these are debates over a couple of things. One is the boundaries of acceptable speech in particular, um, with the side that I would call cultural socialism, which some might know of as wokeism, uh, always arguing that speech should be, yeah. Just quickly, I, I, just quickly. I heard, I've heard you use that in interviews before. And I, find, I mean, so could you just explain a bit about that? Because that's a very interesting term. Yeah, cultural socialism essentially says that all um, race, gender, sexual groups have to have equal outcomes, uh, whether that's money, power, self-esteem, top jobs, etc. And so, uh, and secondly, uh, instead of talking about an economic system oppressing people, it's about cultural narratives and symbols, the names of buildings, the words we use, the history we teach, all of these sorts of cultural things. That's the source of the oppression. So instead of the Marxist view of its of economic oppression and class being the key category, it's uh, symbolic forms of oppression and race, gender, sexuality is the key categories, which kind of means so that the agenda of cultural socialism is then to redistribute uh, power, wealth, and self-esteem uh, between groups. Um, and I should say wokeness, it does have a definition. It's a I would think it's a very useful, tight, scientific definition, which is simply um, the making sacred of historically marginalized race, gender, and sexual identity groups. And so that, that is really what wokeness is. Once you accept these groups are sacred, and there's a, a totem pole with the sacred totems at the top, and the fallen groups, white male, etc., at the bottom, that structures every encounter and it structures your views on every issue pertaining to these things. Okay, so I think I interrupted you there when you were talking a bit about some of the research, but I think we can come back to that because I think what, what you've just described in terms of 
uh, uh, what wokeness is and, and cultural socialism, as you described, I think is really, it'd be really interesting to drill down in that first of all, actually. Um, so I guess my, my immediate question is, um, you, you said, I guess, under the Marxists, that the question was more about the economic structure and uh, the, the, the predominant question on, under wokeness um, is, is, the, is the cultural uh, ways in which people are being oppressed. And you talked about the symbolism and so on. Um, but I guess some people might say, well, in a way that that's somewhat accurate. So if you look at um, maybe the blackface and, and the minstrel shows, um, in, in a lot of ways, these cultural symbols uh, function to reinforce uh, the ways in which people were concretely uh, marginalized, or to, to use the common uh, language. Um, and so how do you make that distinction then between, pres presumably, obviously you're quite critical of wokeness, how do you make that distinction between trying to uh, acknowledge and perhaps maybe not rectify, but at least uh, uh, give genuine, sincere consideration to the very real ways in which um, uh, cultural, symbolic uh, and myths about society, irrespective of the reality, the economic inequality, did did have a um, oppressive effect, and, and the way in which it perhaps might be used today, which is uh, in a way that is uh, essentially just trying to to sanitize all aspects of public life. So, how, how do you make that distinction? Do, does that make sense? Yeah, it does make sense, and I think the distinction is between equal treatment, the sort of what you might call classical liberal or what I would call cultural liberalism, which is about uh, equal treatment, due process, uh, objective truth, um, and all of those things were violated, you know, let's say, so, so for example, the belief that uh, certain races were inferior, a violation of objective truth, or the denial of equal rights to uh, public places and jobs, right? So that's an equal treatment problem. So these things all existed. They were all illiberal um, and can could have been addressed through a civil rights liberalism approach. But but what I think we, where we've moved is from a cultural liberalism to cultural socialism. So from, and if you look at the U.S. case, Lyndon Johnson talking about equal treatment and then talking about equal results and then its goals and timetables for representation and its affirmative action. Or, for example, not uh, saying racist things to somebody to, oh, you've got a, a you, you said something negative about Iran's supreme leader, therefore you are against Muslims. You see what I mean? The second is a sort of twisting of the dial to the point where something which isn't racist is interpreted as racist. And that subtle shift uh, is what I'm talking about when I talk about the shift from cultural liberalism to cultural socialism. Similarly, when, when dealing with the past, uh, one can certainly recognize, uh, you know, sins that countries like Britain and America have committed without falling into the trap of imagining that the world was all rosy uh, and that other non-white societies were not practicing slavery, discrimination, etc. So it's partly about that decontextualization. A good example of this might be the question, uh, Native Americans lived in peace and harmony before European settlers arrived. Uh, roughly 60% of Americans believe that. Uh, the truth is diametrically the opposite. It was more violent in many ways uh, in terms of death rates and attacks and everything. So that's an example of two of this twisting and narrowing of our view of the past. Again, which is part of this shift from I would say cultural liberalism, which is about let's get all the facts out there, let's put everything in context, let's treat people equally, let's have objective truth, to, which wasn't there, right, to this sort of more uh, cultural socialist position. I should say one other thing is the shift from an individual level approach looking at racism or sexism to this so-called structural. So moving from identifying individual acts of discrimination to these unmeasurable shadowy so-called structures I think the term racism without racists char you know, characterizes it best, that while we can't pick up any individual racist attitudes, uh, you know, but on the other hand, there are these things you can't see that somehow inhabit people's brains without them knowing, and we can't measure them really, but just trust us. You know, so that's, again, the shift 
from the cultural liberal to the cultural socialist. No, that's really helpful, actually, to to um, outline like that. And I, of of course, very much recognise that. And I think, um, you know, if if the Aquano project was uh, on that spectrum, we would be. I hope that the cultural uh, liberal. <laughs> um, I just just one more question <laughs> before before we go back to um the the ways in which you've uh, explored this in research. I mean, so how I so I I very much um, agree with, with you when you when you talk about the the way in which uh, discussions of racism have become increasingly amorphous and often quite psychological. You know, it's about unconscious bias rather than um, actually responding to specific problems that require specific solutions. I, I'm in agreement with you on that. But one of the things that I, I, I've thought about um, at different points in this whole uh, discussion over the last few years is well how how does legacy then put, fit into that because in in a sense um legacy is is not not necessarily about what individuals might be doing um in the present um but you you i think you can make a genuinely liberal and, and, and sincere argument that the uh consequences of things that were done historically um have a concrete impact on the present in ways that might not necessarily be because individuals and specific people are um, acting in racist ways um, intentionally, but because we inherit a whole series of norms and patterns and assumptions, um, some that have been challenged and questioned and overcome at different points, but some that persist. And therefore, in a way that there may well be an amorphous element um, that can't always be pinpointed in like a or this specific institution or this specific person is doing this specific thing but but the the, the consequences of the past do weigh weigh upon us so so what, what what do you say about that argument that um that actually there is something quite intangible about the um historical legacy of um of racial racism essentially yeah i mean i, I kind of follow the coleman hughes line on this which is that uh, I mean, first of all, there are two separate things. One is the impact of past racism on the present is not the same argument as saying there are there is structural racism in the present. Those two things are squashed together. The one is used to justify the other by critical race theorists. So that's the first thing. The second thing, of course, is we need to... I'm a social scientist. I think you need to prove these claims. So it's not enough to just say, oh... This happened in the past, which was bad, and we have some disparity in the present, therefore one caused the other. You actually have to do the work to show. So, for example, we know that, you know, Jews were heavily discriminated. They had a lot of things taken away from them in the past. Uh, Japanese Americans got all of their land and things confiscated. Both groups are obviously doing extremely well. It's not obvious in, you know, it may be the case, as Coleman says, you know, in the US, in the case of American blacks, for example, yeah, after they were freed, their literacy rates just shot up in, at, at an unprecedented rate in human history, in a way. And they were very successful, even though they were segregated. They they had successful, thriving, you know, businesses and so on. I mean, it's not obvious that the problems of today's African American population are necessarily purely the result of the past. That is, they've been stamped for good by the events that happened. 100 years ago or what 50 years ago whatever um, so again i would say i'm open to that argument it needs to be proven similarly with the structural arguments today i mean if you want to prove that some institution retains a tilt that was put in there for racist reasons those reasons have fallen away but the but the structure is still there fine let's let's look at the data uh, this is something that is never done by critical race theorists so i i have to say i'm very skeptical of these claims and I think our operating assumption should actually be the, be the reverse. That the operating assumption is there is no effect unless you can show it and counter the counter arguments. What's called the null hypothesis, and that sort of scientific approach is just not used. Hmm. No, I, I no that that's very interesting, and I think um, I I think you make an important point that actually, um, and and this is something that um, you know I I, I discuss and. Is something that is very interesting the fact that many groups have succeeded um despite historical uh oppression on and, and so on and so it, it's very difficult to, to pinpoint uh what historical 
uh, things may or may not be impacting the president. And if you want to uh, make a big claim like that, then that also requires you provide you know, strong evidence to support that. So I think I think that's um, yeah, I think that's and I think that's a fair argument. OK, so go, going back to w w what you were saying about cultural socialism and wokeness. And um, but before I rudely interrupted you and you were talking about your. Uh... No, no, that's fine. <laughs> That's what we're here for. <laughs> um, when you were talking about some of the research that um, you, you've been looking into, um, could you uh, continue to elaborate on that? Well, yeah, I mean, I'm sort of I'm very uh, well, I've done a, a number of large scale surveys in the US and in the UK, let's say on cultural war attitudes. Uh, and I've done surveys of academics as well, look surveys of students. You know, you see a number of things. I mean, one is that, you know, young people, are just vastly more cultural socialist and woke than older people, even when you account for their political leaning. So an old, a, a leftist over age 50 is just a lot more tolerant than a leftist under age 30. Um, we've got data from from the 1970s onwards in the US that asks, and, and we can show that an 18 year old in the 70s, 80s, really right up until the two, early 2000s was just, was more of a, a value relativist, more kind of a tolerant value relativist, um, but they have become much more of of a moral absolutist, believing that there are fixed and absolute moral values. Um, and also the, and this is around the identity question. So uh, allowing a racist to speak in public, that's been asked since the early 70s in the US. And for a number of decades that went up, along with a allowing a communist and a militarist to speak. And then this starts, the, the, the racist one starts to diverge from the other four or five questions they asked, and that starts to take on more symbolic significance, along with sort of sexist uh, speakers. And then, so already by the time we get into the 90s and 2000s, it's already starting to diverge. So I think we've actually got a longer standing. I mean, one of my arguments is actually um, what we're looking at is the outworking of a logic that begins in the 1960s, really. Um, and spreads and gradually the volume gets turned up and turned up and turned up. Um, I don't, I kind of, there's a book by Chris Rufo that argues that uh, the radical ideas of the Black Black Panthers and the Weather Underground and some of these, uh, Herbert Marcuse and others, those ideas have now become the dominant ideas in universities and spread into schools and businesses. And so, I mean, I don't take that view as much. My, my view is much more that what you had was this slow incremental evolution. You can see it in the legal rulings around affirmative action and around hostile environment and harassment law. All of this stuff just incrementally became more and more extreme in a way, and the way it was implemented in companies became more extreme gradually, not overnight just because of George Floyd, but actually you had had this gradual evolution from sort of racial sensitivity to cancel culture. Um, and similarly, in terms of um, something like the racism, anti-racism taboo, Shelby Steele, African-American conservative writer, talks about this. Uh, this sort of spreads. It sort of starts out referring to a sort of smaller uh, group of phenomena, and it spreads to encompass a wider and wider and wider uh, feature uh, features of daily life. And it spreads to also... Uh, gender with sexism and it sh spreads to homophobia and then transphobia. Um, the consequences become greater and greater and greater. There's more cancellations. So I, I kind of think this is partly about um, ideas which were already there in the 60s, not necessarily cultural Marxist ideas, but just sort of liberal egalitarian ideas that take become amplified over time through a, co a process known as concept creep. Uh, so bullying, trauma, all these words start to mean not just real bullying, but actually feeling like somebody was mean to you. <laughs> um, and, and so all of this kind of mission creep in these terms is part of this process that we've lived through. Now, yes, it's true that George Floyd, it's true that social media, and it's true that Donald Trump and these things accelerated uh, some of these processes. But, and, and I think especially... The fact that the media went from a classified ads model to a clickbait uh, model and you had more young people who were online coming in and yeah that all made a big difference but fundamentally the ideas are the same largely as they were in the late 60s so that, that's very interesting so i mean 
this generational divide has has, has become a very uh, important element of this discussion. I mean, it also leads me to think, I mean, who's really responsible then? Because presumably when we, when we talk about the older generations being much more um, in, in the more classical sense, and then the, the younger uh, up and coming New York Times and publishing house uh, staff are uh, a lot less tolerant. <laughs> um, well, the older generations presumably raised the younger generations. And so why, I, I kind of wonder who, who's really responsible for that? I mean, you could argue that um, the yeah, within within the institutions that that, that had, um, and the wider culture was shifting and, and it was very difficult for people to, to, to change the tide. And you see that now with parents um, when they find that there's particular materials in school, you kind of think, what, what do you do? Do you take your kid out of school? Um, but I guess my question is, who do we, who, who, is there a group of people? Um, I don't know, is it a cultural question? Is it a, 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 a failure of political leaders? When, when we're questioning who contributed or what led to this change? Uh, is there any group that might be responsible? Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, one thing you see is that in academia and academic papers, there was already a high level of discussion around racism, sexism, homophobia. It was, it was becoming very dominant already in the 80s and 90s. What happens in the 2010s is this breaks into the media. Uh, that's really the big shift. And then it gets into young people. Um, through partly through social media and pop culture, but also through schooling. So I think, yeah, the adults through pop culture, social media, schooling, perhaps advertising, are then responsible for transmitting this. I mean, the the other thing, of course, they're transmitting is psychological fragility. Uh, again, the the expansion of the term bullying and trauma and emotional safety and all this stuff. This therapeutic language is is growing within academia, and again, it has a has a burst through into the the media and where, where it reaches uh, younger people, and and of course, younger people who are are much more likely to say that they're anxious or depressed than older people. And if you say that um, I'm anxious or depressed all the time, you are much more likely to say Britain is a racist country. Uh, I've experienced racism or sexism or whatever. And so there's a there's a relationship between mental health declining and wokeness. And, and I think it runs not through young people not being allowed to play outside, as Jonathan Haidt would argue. I think it's much more that these this sort of bloated mission creep in therapeutic uh, terms that was already current in academia from the 80s and 90s breaks through into the mass culture in the 2010s. Um, and that is really what kind of sensitizes, radicalizes uh, a significant number of young people. I should say that there is an increasing gender divide amongst young people. Younger uh, men are a lot less woke than younger women. Um, there's not a big racial divide, actually. In Britain, for example, young minorities are less woke than young whites. But there's a big divide on sexuality and a big divide on, on gender. So it's kind of, uh, that's how I would read the change. Um, but I also think probably there's more polarization now in that young population. Yes, on gender lines, but also increasingly on which media sites that they visit. And I, I would expect this to become a bigger and bigger political issue as that young generation becomes the median voter. No, I, I think I think is a very fascinating um, area that you touched upon the the relationship between wokeness and the broader therapeutic culture. I think I think that's definitely a really important um, um, area that that is really worth uh, uh, people diving in much further. Um, I, I guess my my thoughts following that then is that when we're thinking about solutions and responses then so i know that there is this argument that oh the the reason wokeness has uh, has increased is because we've all given up on god um and and you know i have a, i totally understand where people are going with that um and i i don't necessarily completely buy it but i do think that there is something important in that. <laughs> but i think there's something important in that critique which is that um in the sense of the there is, I think there is something in the idea of the, a crisis of shared moral values and shared moral ideals, because part of the thing that um, enables people to cultivate a sense of resilience um, is the fact that they have 
guardrails and they have um guides and they have you know shared shared ideas and shared vision that they can look to the past and and that and that also takes them on to the future and i think a lot of the the kinds of values the kinds of ideals um that uh p would presumably hold communities together and connect them with their their family and their communities and their nation have been delegitimized and so th i i think there is something to the idea that um this generation of young people um are isolated in in both a sense of meaning and actually in, in the way that society is um, today. So, I mean, so I guess what I'm saying is that what, what, what do you think of the idea that um, part of the part of the problem and in turn part of the solution is in the cultivation of a stronger sense of shared morality, shared ideals, um something that people can genuinely hold on to now that may not be religion i i don't know what that what the various different alternatives there might be but that that is seemingly missing yeah i completely agree i mean you know one thing about the religion it's tricky whether it has to be religion right i mean jonathan Haidt has this uh, the moral foundations theory and so it is true there is a morality out there but it revolves around only two of five or six of what he calls moral taste buds or moral foundations, right? So the two taste buds that matter for today's morality are equality, as in each group getting the same outcome, share of resources and power, uh, equality, and the other is the, so what he calls the care harm moral foundation, that people being harmed, weak people being harmed. So you have a morality that revolves exclusively around those two foundations. Uh, the, the others that to, are to do with group loyalty and uh, you know, sanctity and all of these sorts of things are, uh, are have withered away. Um, and now that could be religion, but I, I think if you, I think patriotism or, or obligations to family, community, nation are a more important source of those countervailing, cross-cutting, you know, so what we, we do want the, the care, harm, and the equality, the moral foundations, but we also want the sort of the, the, the sort of um, group loyalty uh, and liberty and other foundations to help to check the excesses and the extremism from those two foundations, and we've lost that. Um, now, religion is tricky. I think if you look on surveys and you and you ask, you know, look at people who are highly religious and not highly religious, you see very little difference in the U.S. Let's say uh, in their level of agreement with uh, uh, various culture war statements or woke statements. Um, the only reason it matters is because people who are religious tend to be conservatives and conservatives are much less woke. Uh, but in terms, if you take a sort of a, a left-wing person who is religious, they're going to be as woke as a left-wing person who isn't religious. Now, in Britain, it's the, it seems to be the case that even a left-wing person who is religious is a little less woke. So in Britain, it seems to matter a bit more. But what really sort of really matters more than anything else is attachment to nation you know that that is really uh, something that strongly predicts how woke you're going to be on these on these questions and so i think the, the atrophying of responsibilities to various kinds of collectivity whether it be family but especially nation uh really helps to explain why we've seen uh these these the foundations of equality and care harm just become the center of young people's moral universe. There's literally nothing else. So if there's nothing else, there's no reason why not to go extreme on those values. Why, if a fundamentalist comes along and says, it's a bit like if a, a, an Islamist fundamentalist in a pious Muslim society says, you know, men and women can't sit together. Uh, it says so in the Quran. It's very hard to answer back to that if your whole morality is based around the same beliefs. And so we've got just these two moral foundations if a fundamentalist comes in and says um, you know it, it emotionally harms somebody to say anybody could make it in britain then you could be cancelled for that uh, and there's no there's no argument back and this is one of the reasons why i think with, with all the dei and crt and things going on in schools and organizations a lot of people just do not know how to answer back to those claims well uh, okay, on that point that you just touched upon in terms of uh the, the the other things that people can hold on to um and i think you, you've spoken about this and, and written about this idea of kind of patriotism and and uh and and the nation i mean well, where, where do you see that conversation now because obviously um the the whole uh, populist backlash um 
arguably failed to materialize uh, in in the transformative way that perhaps people had expected um you know, whether that was the the 80 seat majority of boris johnson um uh, i think many people ha were, were left disappointed um <laughs> and uh yeah, and, and you might say similar things in, in America as well. Now, it, it, it is clear that there are still people and, and different groups that are, are, are working to uh, capture uh, some elements of the uh, what was described as the realignment and, and other things. Um, and But I, I don't know where you see that conversation now, um, if it still has a lot of momentum, um, wh whether or not there are uh, alternative forms of identity uh that can gain cultural authority um at the moment well i i do think the first thing i would say is that po populism national populism is perhaps the only major force that is mounting a strong resistance to uh wokeism now i'm aware that obviously liberals and even some traditional socialists are resisting it in the culture, but in terms of effectively blocking its path, um, almost all of the major initiatives are coming, A, from the right, but certainly from the populist, more culturally oriented right. To the extent that this has not succeeded in uh, defending institutions and culture uh, from the onslaught of the woke, it's mainly because uh, the right has been more libertarian and low tax and establishment rather than populist. Uh, now, I would say that in the case of the U.S., you had Trump's takeover of the Republican Party. Now, there's a lot of problems with that in upholding crazy beliefs about the election and so on. But on the other hand, the good thing it did was it, it got rid of uh, a group of people who were only interested in lower tax for themselves or their donor base and introduced some of these cultural questions. And so I would say that uh, under... Under Trump, for example, there was resistance to removal of statues, to political correctness, to and, and subsequently with people like Ron DeSantis, uh, there's there's very strong resistance to the trans agenda, to the critical race theory agenda, and so on. You look to Canada, where this is much weaker, um, and the the sort of force, forces of radical trans ideology, critical race theory, and so on have really steamrolled through all the institutions and the media, relatively unimpeded. Britain's kind of intermediate. You had, you know, you talk about Brexit, but Brexit really, there were two wings of Brexit. There was the culturally conservative wing, which reflects most Brexit voters, and there was the libertarian um, Singapore on Thames, low tax Britain, and that was the dominant strand in terms of the elite. They took over the Brexit movement, Johnson, Truss, Cummings, these, these sorts of people. They don't, they're not as motivated by cultural issues. So I think the verdict is still out. I do think that really populist conservatism right now politically is the only bulwark against the complete victory of, of this ideology in our institutions. The hope, of course, is down the road once the populists, if they're able to win elections, and, and my survey data would suggest that the voting base tends to be two to one against most of the woke positions right now. So this is a very profitable issue for the right to go after. If they start winning elections, they can hopefully convince the center. I mean, the center left is already convinced, but they have to shut up in a lot of left wing parties. But if the right starts to win on these issues, the center left can say, you know, people like David Shore in America or, or James Carville or that kind of person will say, listen, we're losing elections, we've got to sort of get sensible on this stuff, and then hopefully the center-left becomes more sensible. I mean, Starmer has, has moved a little bit in this direction under pressure, uh, under this kind of pressure. That's the hope, for me anyway, is that the right leads, the center-left follows, and then the left parties kind of come into line on these issues. Um, so that's hopefully the pattern, and I so again, I do think that, the, that populism is putting up a, a resistance on this. I think it's a this argument that you need a kind of strong authoritative counterforce in in order to perhaps move the Overton window, and and that and that may well and that could be a kind of populist uh, backlash. But the the um the the populist listening to this uh, will will be cheering this on. But I I can I suspect some of the liberals will be uh uh feeling very uncomfortable hearing that we need another or or, or possibly the solution may be found in another um uh, national populist. Uh, type of backlash. I mean, what, what, 
what what do you say to liberal minded folk because i think i think her, what, one of the things that i i think my they may say is actually the, the problem with anti wokeness or the problem with a uh, criticism of wokeness and, and, and so on is that it doesn't have the same elite status and that one of the ways in which you need to uh to, to win the culture wars is to make your ideas um elite elite in, in its status that, that other elites want to be associated with it because it makes them feel that they have higher status as well and that's one of the problems i think uh, you could argue with with uh populism is that it still whether or not it's justified or not is a different question i just think it does still have this feeling of um uh something that people of of high mind and high status and and uh, of a uh, uh, refined character uh, w w would not succumb to such populist uh, behaviors um w w what do you say to that that one that there's a pr problem in in populism and, and unless it can really win the uh, the hearts and minds of uh, uh, status seeking folk it, it it has it has a, a, a obstacle well i don't know i mean i think first of all the status question is tricky i mean i think if you were to look at a university setting the social justice warrior very radical woke group actually has lower status than the more objective scientific people who publish in top journals. And, and likewise, I think, you know, you look at the New York Times and some of the mainstream media, you know, you notice a somewhat of a shift now where they published, they've been willing to publish things that are anti-woke, partly because the top layers and the senior people in those organizations don't really see it as, as having quite as, as high a status uh, perhaps. Um, and so I, I'm not sure about the status thing, actually. Um, the other thing is, is that, you know, liberals, they may not like the antics of, a, of, a, of the populace, uh, but I'm not sure they're so opposed necessarily to the effects of their laws. So getting abolishing affirmative action. I think quietly, there's probably a fair bit of liberal support for that. You can see it in the sort of letters in the New York Times. These are all New York Times, like 93% Democrat readers. But there's quite a bit of support for this colorblind approach. Uh, and there wasn't a huge backlash, I think, amongst a lot of that swath of center leftists to getting rid of affirmative action. Similarly with, and, and so, I mean, part of the problem here, I would say to those liberals is, is you know, liberalism there are two ver versions of this one is the kind of madisonian founding fathers of america uh liberal john stuart mill liberalism which is, but not so much john stuart mill but the, the madisonian founders uh very much anti-government it's all about threats to liberty from the government that's the way liberals have been used to thinking about liberalism you really got to watch out for what the government they're going to take away your liberty um, but there's a sort of older tradition going back to um, Hobbes and even to some extent John Locke uh, that is that that actually sees government as having a role in protecting people's liberty from private violence from private actors who would take away your liberty and I think we've actually kind of the wheel is turned and we're back in that kind of a world where private censorship private you know institutions like universities and corporations are actually the bigger threat. Uh, to liberty than government. Um, and when that happens, you actually need government to regulate, to so say universities, you can't go and censor people or you're going to get fined, like in the UK Higher Education Freedom Bill. That's an example. Or or you can't debank somebody. Uh, you know, th that is actually uh, protecting people's liberty against institutions. And so I would say to a lot of liberals, you have to think in terms of three levels, government, institutions, and citizens. We're in a situation now increasingly where the threats are coming out of that middle layer and not from government. And so, I mean, there are, of course, some threats from government too, but on that perspective, that then defends a more interventionist approach. I was just going to say that um, I, I just have a couple more questions because you actually uh, reminded me of something that I thought was quite interesting. And, and don't feel that you have to categorize yourself, but it would be quite interesting to know where you where you might say that you stand on, on, on the political spectrum because... Um, that you've obviously been making a certain uh, a liberal arguments uh, against wokeness, but I, I, I also, but 
maybe uh, conservative arguments as well around national populism. But also, there has been this rise of, uh, I don't know if you're, uh, this whole post-liberal uh, discussion, um, that this idea that, you know, liberalism's, uh, that there's a kind of moral vacuum at the heart of liberalism and that actually we need to also use, uh, uh, embrace the idea of using the power of the state to essentially uh, maybe enforce, maybe it might be a strong word, but to uh, institute a, a, a kind of moral framework. Um, yeah, well, where would you stand on the political spectrum if you had to? Yeah, I, I think I'm, I, I'm so, it's a terrible answer, but I'd say I'm kind of a liberal conservative because so, so I, I wrote this piece saying why I'm a liberal national conservative is that I believe in liberalism. So I'm not post-liberal in the sense of saying like, uh, Patrick Deneen or um, a number of others, well, Yoram Hazoni, that, that, that we should have a sort of public religion, you know, we should teach the Bible to all school children. And I mean, my, I would be more of a separationist and I would sort of say, no, what we should, what we need to do is not change the current, you know, woke dispensation and overthrow it and install our conservative dispensation, um, I actually would like to just see, I believe you can have neutrality and balance. Um, and so what I think we should be working towards is actually purging uh, wokeness from the school system and from institutions to achieve neutrality. So civil service neutrality, schools, non-indoctrination, balance in the history curriculum. I think you can achieve neutrality and balance, and whereas the post-liberals would say neutrality is impossible. I don't agree with that, really. I think you can you can approach it. Um, so that's sort of my disagreement with them. I also kind of think that liberal, they would say, oh, liberalism automatically has led to, uh, you know, cultural socialist extremism because, you know, if you are tolerant of, let's say, deviant behavior, then you're approving of those deviant behaviors, and that then means you're going to push them. I don't think so. I think you can have a, 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 a negative liberal regime of toleration without celebration and endorsement. And we have to get that balance right. So I think we can get these balances right. But of course, we do have to shift back and away from this, what I would, what Isaiah Berlin would call positive liberalism that's been pushed in institutions. Well, thank you uh, so much uh, for joining me on the podcast, uh, Professor Eric Kaufman. Fascinating thoughts. Uh, t tell us where we can uh, find your work and also um, your next book and when it's out. Well, thanks, Anaya. Yeah, so um, I'm on the internet at uh, sneps.net, S-N-E-P-S.net, and also on Twitter at uh, E-P-K-A-U-F-M. Uh, the next book, uh, tentatively titled uh, Taboo, um, How Making Race Sacred Led to Cultural Revolution with Forum Books. And that will be, should be out in January or February. Or we haven't yet nailed a, a final date, uh, but hopefully uh, you can check it out. And um, thanks. I've enjoyed it very much. And yeah, when, when it's out, we will be sure to uh, be sharing it around um, all of our listeners and our networks. Thank you so much. Thanks a lot. Thank you.